studying 1 Corinthians. We come this evening to chapter 4. You must understand that uh, Paul was uh, subjected to a good deal of criticism by the Christians in uh, Corinth. Um, or not just criticism, it went as far as abuse. And so in this chapter he um, begins to tackle all the the impudence and the abuse and the criticism that he has received from the Christians in Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 1. But this is how one should regard us ministers. Eh, as servants of Christ and as stewards of the mysteries of God. And that applies, of course, not simply to ministers of the word, such as myself, but to all Christians. In some sort of way, every Christian is called upon to be a servant of Christ and a steward of the mysteries of God. Uh, moreover, uh, it's a mistranslation, the Greek says, here meaning here on earth, down here. Here it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy or faithful. But with me, as far as I'm concerned, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or indeed by any human court. I do not even judge myself. I'm not aware of anything against myself. I don't think I've done anything wrong in a major sort of way. I'm not aware of anything against myself. But I am not thereby acquitted. Because it is the Lord who judges me. And therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness, and who will disclose the purposes of the human heart. And then every man will receive his commendation, both the critics, and the criticized from God. I have applied all of this to myself and also to Apollos, whom you championed for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written and that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one minister against another minister. For who sees anything special in you? Who sees anything superior in you? What have you that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if it were not a gift. Amen, and God will add a blessing to the reading of his own word, to his name, be the honor and the praise. Now I'd like to look this evening at these opening important seven verses in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 4. And I think one of the most important things uh, to notice about these seven verses is uh, the atmosphere of uh, judgment that hangs over them. There is an ethos, a, an air of uh, judgment. And uh, many of the terms that Paul uses are terms that you would hear in a court of law where judgment was being pronounced. And this is not really unnatural because uh, in the previous chapter, Paul has been speaking about the last judgment, 
the great final assize when uh, Christians are to come up before the throne of God for an evaluation of the quality of their service on earth. Wood, hay, or stubble, gold, silver, precious stones, the quality of service we render on earth determines the quality of glory that we shall enjoy in heaven. There is a direct connection between the quality of our service down here and the quality of the eternity that we shall enjoy after we die. And so chapter 3 speaks about the last judgment. Here in the opening of chapter 4, the immediate reference is to the Corinthians and their criticism of Paul's ministry. It seems that although the Apostle Paul had gone through agonies to establish the Church of Christ in Corinth, the Christians there tended to be very superior in their attitude towards Paul and very critical of his ministry. For example, if you know the first and second letters to Corinth, you uh, will certainly know that later on they challenged um, his apostleship and they doubted whether he should be on the same level as the other apostles like Peter and uh, the others. And uh, since an apostle in those days was someone who had uh, two qualifications, first of all, he had to have seen the Lord in the flesh. And secondly, he had to have been personally commissioned by the Lord. Then that was what they were challenging in the Apostle Paul. They were questioning whether he had seen the Lord with his eyes. And they were doubting his commission as a minister and an apostle of Jesus Christ and they questioned his whole apostleship. And so you have a long series of verses later on in which Paul deals very particularly with them, this problem. In fact, he tries to deal with it in the opening verse of First Corinthians. <laughs> and he sort of gives them a, a knock on the nose from the very start. He says, Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle. But that wasn't enough for the Corinthians. And you'll see that um, he really had to deal with this in uh, some detail. If you turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and the first two verses, he deals with the matter there. He says, Am not I free? <clears throat> Am not I an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord on the Damascus road? Are not you my workmanship in the Lord? If to other Christians I am not an apostle, at least I am an apostle to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. You are the evidence that I am an apostle of Christ. Later on in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, in chapter 15 and verse 9, he says, um, well, at verse 8, Last of all, as to one untimely born, Christ appeared also to me. His eyes had seen the Lord on the Damascus road, for I am the least of the apostles, and I am not fit to be called an apostle. But he was called one, because I persecuted the church of God. 
not to weary you with quotations. If you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, the second letter he wrote, and he hammers it home again in the first verse, chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, he had seen the Lord and he had been commissioned. Chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians, come now, and verse 5, still hammering the point home, I think that I am not in the least inferior to these superlative apostles that you boast of. They were boasting that certain men in the church in Corinth were superior apostles. Um, later on in chapter 12, lastly, in chapter 12 and verse 11, I have been a fool. You forced me to it, for I ought to have been commended by you. For I was not at all inferior to these superlative apostles of yours, even though I am nothing. The signs of a true apostle were performed amongst you in all patience with signs and wonders and mighty works. The Corinthians were criticizing Paul. They were sitting in judgment on his ministry. We'll also see later on that the Corinthians criticized Paul on the grounds of his pulpit speech and his pulpit presence. What they actually said was this, his bodily presence is weak and his speech is contemptible. What a comforting verse that is for preachers. His bodily presence is weak and his speech is contemptible. In other words, he lacked two things. His bodily presence was weak. He had no style. He had no pulpit style. He had no grace in his preaching. And secondly, his speech was contemptible. He was no orator. He didn't have the Greek gift of oratory and speech and fluency. Talk about biting the hand that feeds you. Talk about hurting the people who love you the most. My Christian friend, can you not testify that the deepest wounds and hurts you have received have been from the people you have loved the most? I can certainly testify that in my ministry, my ministry, the sorest hearts and wounds I have received have been from people that I love the most. I tell you, there are people who have gone into the Christian ministry and into Christian service on the mission field from, from my ministries. They've broken my heart. I could well imagine that my greatest sin was this, that I loved them too much. And they turned against me. The Corinthians were biting the hand that fed them, and now they were sitting in judgment on Paul's ministry. Now that's the first important thing to notice, that these first seven verses have an atmosphere, an ethos, an air of judgment. Now let me ask you this, 
Have you discovered yet that attack is one of the best forms of defense? You found that out yet? Well, learn it from an old war horse who has been criticized quite a bit. Attack is one of the best ways of defending yourself when you're being criticized. Of course, I'm speaking about when you're criticized unjustly and wrongfully. One of the most strategic things you can do is to disarm your opponent or your critic by indicating that perhaps all is not well with him. You see, it's often the case that criticism springs from a warped life, a twisted life. People who are always critical and sour and disapproving. People who don't go around saying kind and generous, loving things about people are very often twisted, warped, little people. And criticism often comes from people who are frustrated in their own psyches and their souls. They're unfulfilled and they've gone rather sour on life. And the only way they can find fulfillment is criticizing people who have found fulfillment. And in the Christian world, drink this in. This is jolly good psychology. It is my experience that criticism very often comes from Christians who are backsliders and who are drifting away from Christ's highest and best for their lives. Christians who have refused the challenge of the cross and the challenge of Christian discipleship. It is my experience that Christians who refuse the challenge of the cross and the challenge of Christian discipleship, sooner or later become critics. It may take months, it may take years, it may take a lifetime, but at the end of the road, if you are a Christian refusing the cross and refusing a life of Christian discipleship and obedience, you will finish up as a critic. People like that, my Christian friends, are very easily disarmed. Attack is the best form of defense. And you simply need to turn to critics like that if they criticize you unjustly. And say, well, what you say about me is all very interesting. But what about this in your life? And what about that in your life? And where do you stand in relation to this? And why have you drawn the line with Jesus Christ? Attack is the best form of defense. And that's what Paul does here in these seven verses. I want you to see that tonight. See this tonight. He does it in four telling sallies. And he launches out into the Corinthian critics. First of all, he starts speaking about servants and stewards in verse 1. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and as stewards 
of the mysteries of God. In other words, this is how God thinks you should look at us. This is what God thinks of us. Servants and stewards. But are you sure that you, the critic, are a servant and a steward? You who sit in judgment on another man's servant? You who criticize ministers of Christ and of the word of his truth? Are you a servant of Christ and a steward of the mysteries of God? Attack is the best form of defense. And in fact, when Paul speaks about servants and stewards here, he uses two very special words. You see, normally the word for a servant in the New Testament is the Greek word diakonos, from which we get the English word deacon. And a deacon was somebody who served at tables, someone who waited at tables. But that's not the word that he uses for a servant of Christ here. The word he uses is the Greek word huperetes, H-U-P-E-R-E-T-E-S, huperetes, and it means an under rower or a rower on the lowest banks of oars in a galley. Hooper Etes. Now, I suppose you know that Roman galleys, when they were not being driven by wind, were driven by slaves pulling the oars. And these oars were arranged in ranks. Some ships had one rank of oars. Some had two. And some of the really fast ships, the galleys, had three ranks of oars with slaves inside pulling the oars. Uh, a ship with three ranks of oars was called a trireme. And the Roman triremes were the terror of the Mediterranean in their time. What happened was this, that the best quality slaves were put on the top, near the sun, and the light to keep them healthy and strong. And the lowest quality slaves were put on the bottom, near the bilges, and the ballast, and the squalor, and the filth. And the people in the bottom were called the Huperetes, the lowest rowers in the banks of oars. And that's the word that Paul uses for a servant of Christ here. It's a reference to lowly service. It's a reference to menial service. It's a reference to nobody's doing obscure jobs down in the bilges, down in the bowels of the ship, amongst all the muck, the servants of Jesus Christ. And the second word uh, translated stewards is um, the Greek word oikonomos, oikonomos. And oiko is the Greek for a household. Nomos is the Greek for law. Deuteronomy. Nomos. Oiko nomos. And an oikonomos was someone who ruled a house in his master's absence. We would say a butler or an overseer or in the highlands we would call the oikonomos the factor or the gilly on the estate. Somebody who handled the master's resources in the master's absence. First Peter 
chapter 4, Peter tells us that all stewards, all Christians should be good stewards, oikonomos, managers of a master's house, good stewards of the varied grace of God. And those two words, servant and steward, a lowly under rower for Jesus Christ and a ruler in the absence of the master, these are words that are calculated to demolish all critics. My friends, I cannot honestly recall any critic who has played the part of a servant or a steward well. I don't know critics who are prepared to become underlings for Christ, engaged in lowly, humble, obscure service. I don't know any critics like that. And that's Paul's first attack on the Corinthian critics. The best form of defense is attack. Is there anybody here who is being criticized for his Christian testimony? Are you ever criticized by your fellows for the stand that you take on eternal things? Take a second look at your critics. Take a long, hard, penetrating look at their lives and raise a few questions. It will bring you peace of mind. Secondly, Paul mentions, mentions the word um, faithful or as it is in the RSV, trustworthy in uh, the second verse. He says, moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy. And uh, the idea here is the idea of the absent master. The boss cannot always be around. The boss is a very busy person and he has other business to attend to. And therefore, when he's off on his business, he entrusts the work to men who will get on with it. And that is the quality of faithfulness or trustworthiness that God requires of his servants. I think that the word dependability is a good translation. And that is what Christ requires of his stewards. Not success. Jesus doesn't ask for that we be successful. Numbers, money, heads to count, souls saved, flourishing kirks, successful evangelistic campaigns. God doesn't require success. He doesn't require popularity. Everyone thinking that you're a great Christian. He doesn't require fame or honor or esteem or recognition. Jesus had none of these things in this world. All that God requires is that you be a trustworthy steward, a faithful, dependable steward. And I'm sure that Jesus requires this of us for a very special reason. You see, faithfulness is one of the qualities and the attributes of God stressed over and over again in the Old Testament. God is described 
as a faithful God. And what his Father is, Jesus requires of us. I don't want to weary you with language, but you may be interested to know that the word for faithfulness in the Old Testament comes from the root Amen. The word for faithfulness is the word Emun, ah, E-M-U-N, Emun, Amen, Amen, ah. And it means something that is established, something that is trusted, something is true. Uh, I like to translate the word faithfulness in the Old Testament, the amenness, the rock-likeness, the faithfulness of God is his amenness. You can lean on him and he doesn't move. You can stand on him and he doesn't fall away beneath you. God is a trustworthy, faithful God. And we are required to be like him. One or two references in the Psalms to this. First of all, in Psalm 36. And it's interesting how in the Psalms, the steadfast love of God, what we call the mercy of God, is linked to his faithfulness. Emuna, Amen, his Amen nature. It's Psalm 36 and uh, verse 5. Thy steadfast love, O Lord, thy mercy, it's so great that it extends to the heavens and thy faithfulness, thy dependability and rock-likeness. Why? It goes up to the very clouds. Psalm 40. And verse 7. These words are applied in the New Testament to Jesus Christ, standing in the middle of the congregation, preaching to the people. Psalm 40 and verse 7. Then I said, Lo, I come, in the roll of the book it is written of me, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Thy law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. I have preached your gospel. Lo, I have not restrained my lips, as thou knowest, O Lord. Look at this. I have not hidden thy saving help within my heart. I haven't kept the good news to myself. I have spoken of thy faithfulness, thy amenness, thy trustworthiness, and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy steadfast love for sinners, God's mercy towards sinners. I have not concealed it, nor thy faithfulness, thy amenness from the great congregation. Lastly, Psalm 89, which is full of God's faithfulness. Psalm 89. Oh, this is a painful psalm for me. <laughs> I had to do my Hebrew finals in it. I had to read it and study it in Hebrew and comment on it. Something of a disaster, I think, that I got through. You may smile. Psalm 89. I will sing of thy steadfast love, mercy, O Lord, forever. And with my mouth, I will proclaim thy faithfulness, dependability to all generations. For thy steadfast love, thy mercy, is established forever. And thy faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Verse 5. Let the heavens praise thy wonders, O Lord. Let them praise thy faithfulness in the assembly of the Holy Ones. Verse 8. 
O Lord God of the armies, who is mighty as thou art, O Lord, with thy faithfulness round about thee. Verse 24, my faithfulness and my steadfast love shall be with him, David. Verse 33, I will not remove from David my steadfast love or be false to my faithfulness. Wish there were time we could read Lamentations 3. Oh, surely, one of the famous verses. How often have you sung it? Great is thy faithfulness. You know that verse was written by a man standing in a shambles of Jerusalem. It had just been destroyed. That's why the book of Lamentations was written by Jeremiah to lament the destruction of God's city and standing there surrounded by mountains of rubbish. He could say, Great is thy faithfulness. Now what God is in himself, he requires of his stewards. I like faithful people. I don't care whether our people are gifted or intelligent or smart or clever or ingenious or any of these things. These things don't interest me. I like faithful people. I like people who are always there. And you know they'll be there. And if they're not there, you feel there's something wrong. Something's missing. I've never known a critic who was a faithful steward like that. I don't think that success matters. I don't think that fluency matters. I don't think smartness matters. But dependability, that's the great thing. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy or faithful. In... Um, the next verse, verse 3 onwards, there's Paul's third sally against the critics. And he mentions three courts. First of all, he mentions the court of self. Our self-esteem, what we think about ourselves and our own religious performance. And then he mentions the court of others what other Christians think about us and what they make of our religion and our religious performance. And uh, thirdly, he speaks about the court of God. At verse 3. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. That's the court of others. I do not even judge myself. That's the court of self. Although I'm not aware of anything against myself, I am not thereby acquitted because it is the Lord who judges me. And that is the third court. Of course, you, you can see the fallibility of the first two courts, can't you? Uh, the court of self is fallible because uh, we're biased in favor of ourselves and because of our self-love. We're biased in favor of ourselves. <laughs> it's, it's like trying to measure a broken ruler with another broken ruler. It's like trying to judge a seven-inch ruler with a five-inch ruler. It's a false judgment. When you sit in judgment on yourself, 
it's a false judgment. And when other men sit in judgment on you, it's still a false judgment. Oh, what some power the gift of us to see yourselves as others see us. But you see, that's not who you are. What other men see in you is not who you are. Because their judgment too can be discolored if they are emotionally involved with you or psychologically involved with you. Their judgment of you will be discolored. For example, a husband's opinion of his wife will be biased by the fact that he loves her. Her former fiancé's opinion of her will be biased by the fact that she didn't marry him. And the children's opinion will be biased by the fact that they love their parents. You see, to see ourselves as others see us is not to see ourselves as we really are. Only the third court can be trusted. Only the court of God is the sound court. He who judges me is the Lord. And in fact, that's not only the soundest court of all, it's the safest court of all. Because it's the only court of the three in which you'll get not only truth and clarity and candor and honesty, you'll get all of these in God's presence, truth and clarity and candor and honesty, You'll also get kindness if you ask for it. You'll get mercy if you ask for it. And you'll get acquittal if you ask for it. The safest court of all is God's court. Do you know the story of David's great sin towards the end of his life? He numbered Israel. He was a big man, you know. He'd become important. He had arrived. He was the king now. He wanted to see how big he was. And although God had told him never to number the nation, he was a big man now. And he started numbering Israel. God was angry. And God brought him to judgment and said, David, I give you a choice of three. Which one do you want? Three years of famine. Three months in the hands of men. Or three days in the hands of God. David said, God forbid that I should fall into the hands of men. Give me three days in the hands of God. He preferred the court of God to the court of man. You see, men's courts can be cruel and heartless and vindictive and men's judgments can be cruel and heartless and vindictive the safest court is the Lord's Paul says I am not judged by you critics I do not even judge myself he who judges me is the Lord. And the last sally is found in chapter 4 and verse 6. And Paul speaks about the need for Christians not to go beyond what is written. In uh, verse 6, these words, I have applied all of this to myself I'm not preaching at you he says I've applied it all to myself 
and to Apollos, who was the champion in Corinth, for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn from us not to go beyond what is written, and that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one minister against another minister. And the issue here is the old issue of conformity to Scripture. A life that is dictated by Scripture. A life that is ordered by the precepts and the teachings of Scripture. And Paul says, if you live like this, and if you refuse to go beyond what is written, then you'll always have a proper view of man. You'll never fall into the trap of elevating men into positions of importance. You'll never fall into the trap of exalting the Reverend A over against the Reverend B, which is what they were doing in Corinth. You will never glorify the ministry of that man over against the ministry of this man. You'll never fall into the trap of idolizing ministers and worshipping ministers and building your religion on ministers who are just sinful flesh. How can you build your religion on sinful flesh? But if you refuse to go beyond what is written, and if you live a life that is lived in conformity to Scripture, then you'll give man his place, and you'll give 